Well, this event has been organized by the, uh, the Guild and the Northwest, Northwest Constitutional Rights Center. Uh, the Guild is a progressive association of attorneys, law students, uh, legal workers, um, uh, who believe that the human rights are more sacred than property rights and strive to advance social justice for all people. The Constitutional Rights Center is an organization working to protect the civil rights and civil liberties of activists and disadvantaged groups uh, through advocacy and litigation. Um, We'd like to thank the Unitarian Congregation for welcoming us and helping us put on this series. And I'd also like to thank all volunteers and donors for making this possible. The goal of this series is to help educate people about the steady encroaching um, on our constitutional rights that has occurred under the cur current administration. Uh, we'd like to raise this question in the public awareness. Is this really terrorism? Uh, should, be pe should people be labeled as terrorists because they have political ideals? Uh, there is no question that arson and property destruction are criminal acts, but as I said, is this really terrorism? Uh, tonight are we, are, we are focusing on what we have started calling the terrorist creep. Uh, specifically, we will be discussing how acts that were once simply criminal acts are now terrorist acts. Also, there will be a discussion on how some acts that, use, that used to be protected as free speech are now labeled as terrorism. First, I'll introduce Stephen Wax. Uh, he is in his sixth term as a federal defender for the D District of Oregon. Uh, Mr. Wax received his undergraduate degree from uh, Colgate University and his Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School. Uh, following law school, he clerked for the United States District Judge James Fitzgerald of Alaska. He's also served as an assistant district attorney for Kings County, New York. As an adjunct lecturer at the State University of New York, public defender for Broome County, New York, and as an adjunct professor at Northwestern School of Law, Lewis and Clark College. Uh, Mr. Wax has also represented Dane, Dan Mayfield, which most of you should know, and is currently representing a Guantanamo de detainee. Terror. Definition. The American Heritage College Dictionary, 3rd edition. An intense, overpowering fear. Terrorism, as defined by the American Heritage College Dictionary, is the unlawful use or threatened use of force or violence to intimidate or coerce a society or government, often for ideological or political reasons. It seems to me that it's important to have some common definitional basis for what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, my view is that by definition, terrorism is a type of crime. Crime, by definition, being an act in violation of a law that has a penal consequence. If you think about it, all of the penal laws of the states or the federal government engage in a kind of ranking of seriousness. The government saying that the most serious crimes deserve the most serious punishments. Some capital punishment, some life in prison, and on down to crimes that by definition can't result in a person going to prison, just a fine. And as a general proposition, I think that the government tends to define as the most serious crimes of all those that attack the social order, crimes that undermine the ability of the government to function. Terrorist acts, by definition of the government, are seen as among the most serious of crimes because they undermine the rule of law. What's the rule of law? The rule of law is one of those things that keeps us all free. Well, in thinking about the definition of certain criminal acts as terrorism, it seems to me that it's important to understand why the government would find a reason, an advantage to it from its perspective in taking a crime and putting it into that subset category basket of 
terrorism. Well, when the government feels attacked, I think as when any person feels attacked, the government gets put on edge. When the government feels that its authority is being threatened, the government is more likely to react strongly. And when governments act strongly, governments tend to act repressively. The notion that you know, government has the right to engage in you know, acts of self-protection I think is one that is uh, you know, inherent in the concept of government and inherent in the concept of government, whether it is a democratic society or whether it is a despotic society. It seems to me that in thinking about the redefinition of crime as terrorism, it's important to think about the different ways in which acts of terror or terrorism have been used historically. Go back to the founding of this country. If you were one of King George's minions here, the Boston Tea Party would undoubtedly have been seen as an act of terrorism. Had the colonies not prevailed in the war, the people who engaged in the Boston Tea Party Acts would have been defined by King George at the end of a rope as terrorists. But the colonies prevailed, the United States came into being, and instead they were defined as patriots. So terrorism can be used and has historically been used in this country, in the creation of Israel, in the creation of the Palestinian state in an effort to remove an oppressive government, in an effort to remove an oppressive colonizer. And as the history books get written, some acts of terrorism, some terrorists, end up being defined as the good guys, the patriots, the people who advanced the cause of freedom. But I think it's important to distinguish acts of terror where the goal is the type of thing that I just described from acts of terror that are not designed to change the government, to remove an oppressive government, but are instead intended to change the policy of a government. Okay, government, you're fine. You know, I don't want to get rid of you, but government, I don't like your policies and I want to change your policy. Then I think it's important to ask about acts of terrorism designed to change a policy in a country that is an open democratic society as opposed to a country that is not. And put all that into the context of how the government feels, if governments can feel, when the government is being threatened by acts of terror. Now, if in representing a client, which I do on a daily basis, the person is charged with a drug law violation, a bank robbery, an IRS, uh, you know, crime, and the person is only defined as a criminal, only defined as a criminal. Criminals are bad. You know, if you have criminals and non-criminals, I mean, there is a them and us built into that, but the discourse is on one level. If the government redefines and puts the person into the different basket, the terrorism basket, then it's ratcheting up the feeling that is engendered about the person who's committed the act. They're worse. 
Now, in thinking about these things, I was you know, drawn to you know, the, the importance of language. And some uh, professors and scientists you know, who, who write about linguistics and how language affects thought, how language affects action. And my sense is that you know, that is a very important aspect of what is happening in our country today in terms of what it's doing and how it's labeling people, both people who engage in acts of terrorism, such as flying planes into the World Trade Center, acts of terrorism, criminal acts defined as acts of terrorism when they involve the economy or the ecology and other things. And language is incredibly important in that sense in terms of what it does to us. Uh, there's a cognitive linguistics professor named George Lakoff who I know nothing else about other than what I was able to find and, and read about him who talked about you know, the use of the word terror and uh, you know, war on terror and what the use of that phrase is intended to do. And he says that using the word terror, I mean, whether you're using it as terror or terrorist or terrorism, uh, is intended to activate fear. Whoever chooses to use that phrase, he says, is doing it advisedly. They want to generate fear. And what they what happens when you generate fear, he says, is you activate what he calls the strict father model. What does that mean? Well, I think that that means that what you're doing is calling on, uh, you know, the, the stern father with the uh, belt who is going to keep the kid in line, or the stern father figure of a government that is going to use extremely harsh punishment in terms of responding to people. And that when you use that phrase and you engender, you know, fear in the audience, that the audience is, which is, you know, the body politic, is then more willing to accept repressive measures, accept intrusions on liberty, and accept exceedingly harsh punishments. Ashley Albies there on the end is a uh, National Lawyers Guild attorney who is working with the Constitutional Rights Center in New York, uh, New York, um, and also in Portland challenge, challenging uh, illegal wiretapping. Uh, she graduated from Lewis and Clark Law School in 2005 and currently operates a solo practice. Um, so I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about um, the current NSA wiretapping program. Um, and first I'm going to do a little background on how the the FISA statute that exists that usually governs uh, the wiretapping that the government conducts, um, how that relates to separation of powers. Um, and separation of powers, I think everybody has a general idea that there's the three branches of government and they all check on each other and that's what keeps our government democratic. So the FISA statute allows wiretapping um, uh, according to regulations passed by Congress, according to procedures passed by the uh, Con congressional branch. Um, the executive branch gets to determine who is being wiretapped according to these procedures and then they present this evidence to a judge, the judicial branch, and the judge approves it, gives a warrant, um, and then the wiretapping begins. Currently, the Bush administration is, has bypassed FISA completely. Uh, they say who they're going to wiretap, they say how they're going to wiretap them, and they say why they're going to wiretap them. And there is no sort of procedure from any other branch and no sort of check from any other branch. So this represents a tremendous expansion in executive powers, which is a reaction, like Steve mentioned, um, of a government that, that is threatened and its reaction is to be the stern father, I guess, and all of a sudden crack down on everybody. Um, so this NSA program, the administration has offered up um, 
its legal justification in the form of this 42-page uh, Department of Justice memorandum called the White Paper. It's a fascinating read. I recommend it to anybody. <laughs> um, but basically, the, the administration is saying that the, pre the president has inherent authority as commander-in-chief um, to warrantlessly wiretap um, people in this country. Um, the FISA statute, which is, stands for Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and the FISA court, um, is under the statute, it states that it is the exclusive means by which this type of surveillance will occur unless otherwise authorized by statute. The administration is saying, well, if you think that, um, if, if you're looking for another statute, we say that the authorization for military force which was passed in the days after 9-11, which authorized the president to use all necessary and appropriate force to find the um, people that carried out the 9-11 attacks. Um, this authorization for military force um, is the authorizing statute, which grants the exception to FISA that allows this wiretapping to occur. Even though members of Congress have said that that's, that was not their intent in passing the authorization for military force. In, in addition, um, the FISA statute was amended two times after this authorization for military force was passed. So um, if Congress had intended the authorization to allow this, wireless, this warrantless wiretapping, um, why did they amend the statute twice afterwards and, and continue to require a warrant uh, to be issued. Um, on the other hand, the administration is also arguing that if FISA encroaches on the executive authority to conduct warrantless wiretapping, then FISA is unconstitutional. Um, and their final argument is basically that this type of um, wiretapping is reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. So those are the, the main arguments that the administration makes. Um, this represents a dramatic expansion of executive power. <laughs> it's something that has been tried before by the Nixon admin administration, and it failed, which is why Congress enacted the FISA statute. Um, this would, what they're arguing for is this unchecked executive authority to determine, like I said before, who gets wiretapped, how they get wiretapped, when they get wiretapped, and nobody's gonna no other branch can look at that and then stop it. It's purely within the discretion of the, of the executive branch. Um, already being designated a terrorist organization occurs within the executive branch. Um, the Office of Foreign Assets Control is within the executive and it makes the determination of designated, designating a terrorist organization as a ter terrorist organization. And once they do this, they can seize the assets of that organization. Um, and they can also seize the assets and freeze them pending this investigation. And there's no immediate review of, of this designation. So this is what's happening to a lot of Muslim charities um, across the country that uh, by their governing um, incorporation papers, they are using, trying to use their money to fund humanitarian um, needs in, in Middle East in places where it's very difficult to find someone who's not somehow connected to somebody who's you know, purporting violence, even though they're directing these funds to humanita for humanitarian purposes. So, um, there, the Congress has proposed, or in the Senate at least, um, Mike DeWine has proposed, proposed an amendment. Um, this bill would allow this spying, you know, would label this, this NSA illegal program the terrorist surveillance program and it would basically allow the NSA to continue this warrantless um, eavesdropping for up to 45 days, after which uh, the Department of Justice would either have to drop their surveillance, would have to get a FISA warrant, um, or would go to this small group within the Senate, um, and the Senate could then cut the funding of the program or conduct hearings, but it could not stop the program. And actually, the Senate Intelligence Committee has both of those powers right now, they're just not using them. Um, so, again, I, I keep coming back to this uh, point that this same DeWine Amendment would allow um, and approve by Congress, you know, vesting purely within the executive, this determination of who can be surveilled. Um, 
and again, there's no judicial check. And it can, the executive can initiate if one party is affiliated or supporting any group that might be involved in terrorism, which is a really vague way to define it. Um, and in addition, it, it authorizes fines for disclosure of this created terrorist surveillance program for up to a million dollars or 15 years in prison for anybody that leaks any information about this surveillance program. Um, it's outrageous. <laughs> so the reason why this, you know, beyond um, the foreign realm is that if you look at who the FBI has been targeting recently um, in light of, of the groups, anti-war groups that have been targeted by the FBI, um, recently the ACLU uh, in a FOIA request gained documents that show that the Thomas Merton Center for Peace and Justice, which is a Pennsylvania anti-war organization, has been investigated by the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Um, the group was determined to be an organization opposed to the US war in Iraq. And there's a really good quote in here, that they, they are a left-wing organization advocating, among other political causes, pacifism. So that's who the FBI wants to target. And by expanding the power uh, of them to target these groups, we're opening the door to create a tremendous chill on people's ability to um, challenge what they think are government policies that they, do, that they fundamentally don't agree with. Um, I think that's most of, most of what I wanted to say, besides to add that, you know, to expand this definition of terrorism to include property damage and vandalism, it minimizes the real threats to society. Um, you know, they're operate, calling these sorts of crimes, property damage and vandalism, calling that terrorism is the same thing as comparing the victims of 9-11 and their families to victims of vandalism. There's something seriously wrong there, and we need to talk about this a lot. We need to have people think about these issues critically. Um, I think initial reaction by most people is that, well, those acts were illegal and people, I don't want to condone illegal acts, but that's not the same as, as calling something a terrorist act. So I think that we really need to have people communicate with one another, communicate with activists, communicate with family members, communicate with people about um, this ever-expanding encroachment <laughs> into our political lives because it's supposed to be protected. Zuckerman is an activist attorney who currently works at the law firm of Walker, Warren and Watkins doing primarily criminal defense work. Uh, Mr. Zuckerman has worked on a wide variety of high profile um, cases uh, with high profile defendants, including Craig Rosenbaugh, the former press contact for the Earth Liberation Front, and Trey Arrow, the well-known environmental activist. What I've seen is the word terrorism first started into the English language um, during the French Revolution in the late uh, 18th, 18th century. And its modern use, I'm focusing on what the government sees as a terrorism threat from within, uh, eco-terrorism, but the government uses that word. And where I think the derivation of that term came from and why in the early 70s, the first use uh, of that term uh, started in England, I think, in response to acts done by early root groups of what became the Earth Liberation Front, which started in uh, the United Kingdom. Between 1970 and 75, that term started to be used, although I haven't been able to place it in a uh, particular from one particular source. And where, who was saying the word eco-terrorism? And like Steve said, language is important. And like Ashley said, language is important. It's used for a reason. Where we have a, a threat from outside the country, this stern model comes in, and it's also used from within. But who is really threatened by this um, by vandalism, by eco-sabotage, a uh, word I might use to describe the same thing and what I encourage people to use as well because language is a weapon and it is focused on us and it is focused on us persistently and constantly. 
the government uses the word terrorism whenever it can. That's a premise of this very series. It criminalizes conduct that was not criminalized before, and it calls conduct terrorism where it was not called terrorism before. An example of this, I'll give you a couple of examples. One is the uh, federal crime, very serious federal crime of arson. Arson was arson. However, when applied to people accused of uh, burning a log truck near Estacada in 2001, the government was constantly using the term terrorism. These people are terrorists. June 1st, 2001 is when this uh, happened, a log truck burned. Terrorists did this. Not activists, not arsonists even, but terrorists. Federal judge here in Portland actually told the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Portland to stop using the word terrorism because it did not apply to the case whatsoever and issued a partial gag order because the government was um, having repeated press conferences and issuing press releases calling the acts acts of terrorism. So the judge took a brave stand by doing that. The government has complied with that order in that case. However, the government has continued or at least started in motion calling the defendants terrorists. And I don't think the government has been on record using that word, but the people who were defendants, including Trey Arrow in that case, are commonly thought of by people who are not paying attention as terrorists. So the government can start the wheel going without even being persistent against the particular uh, person it perceives as an enemy. And uh, Trey Arrow is still trying, trying to maintain his innocence from, uh, well, he's in custody in Canada right now and also fighting that label, which is hard to do when the government puts you in custody. Another example is what is commonly known now as the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. It's codified in uh, U.S. Code, uh, Title 18, it's Volume 18, Section 43, Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. It was passed first in 1992 as the Animal Enterprise Protection Act, and it basically was a misdemeanor act saying if there's physical damage to an enterprise, some kind of organization that uses animals in any certain way, then that will be treated as a misdemeanor. The act was changed in 2002 and renamed the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And I, did I say 1992? If I did, I said it meant 2002, which is not a coincidence. Of course, the 2002 would be the year, uh, late 2001 and 2002, where suddenly words were changing and becoming terrorism. Protection changed to terrorism. Protection is the real purpose of the statute. And what we see as a common theme here is a threat, as I see it, to capitalism, where Congress people don't seem to be very smart when they're passing laws and doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they are very, very smart when they are trying to please constituents, especially powerful constituents within their districts. In the House of Representatives, of course, elections are always two years away or less, so they are very, very aware of making their constituents happy and making sure their campaigns are funded. When the Earth Liberation Front burned Two Elks Lodge, its most famous action, the, that was in Summit County, Colorado. And sometime later, the representative from Summit County, Scott McGinnis, became a subcommittee chair in Congress. And the first thing he did, at the urging of uh, Two Elks Lodge and uh, Aspen, um, Ski Corporation, I'm not sure of the exact name of that corporation, pressed him, it was one of his largest donors to his campaign year after year, pressed him to hold hearings, and he did hold hearings. 
and it comes specifically from pressure within. And Summit County, Aspen skiing is the dominant economy. He cannot resist that. He had hearings and let them drop. I think his behavior in that activity and a limited time will keep me from giving more specific examples. But showing the contributions to his campaign as being dominated by Aspen and, and skiing tourism, his determination to have the hearings and then let them drop um, shows, I think, his determination to bring the issue into the public as soon as he had the power to. But then he had other issues and other things he wanted to deal with, make that constituent happy and move on. I think he also realized that it was backfiring on him, his efforts to call people who were doing nothing but speaking and calling them terrorists and threatening them with long prison terms when the government could only show that this person actually spoke his mind. Finally, I'm going to briefly go over the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act that I've already mentioned in a little bit more detail. That act says, basically, if somebody moves across state lines, either physically, over the phone, get that, so you're moving over the phone, or through the internet, with the intent to physically disrupt, disrupt an organization that uses animals in some way, that includes agriculture, making of clothing, cosmetics, testing, which is a big one, or even um, trivial amusement for people's sake, such as aquariums or zoos. Somebody moves, uses the internet or a phone line to disrupt, physically disrupt the workings of that organization, they are guilty under the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. Anything from a minor uh, misdemeanor, petty crime for damage under 10,000, to life imprisonment if somebody dies as a result of that activity. So you have a petty misdemeanor and somebody, uh, say, damages a facility uh, to an amount under $10,000, they can still be technically under this act and the press would be correct in calling them a terrorist, even though the federal definition of a domestic terrorist is a lot more serious than the AETA would have you believe. And that is another way that terrorism is being used against us and is aimed at us. Recently, six people were convicted and the organization Stop Hunting, Huntington Animal Cruelty for basically maintaining a website where they were accused and the uh, jury believed and found them guilty of in New Jersey recently, this month was of maintaining a website where people could post messages against a particular corporation, describe what they're doing, how they are doing it, and what can be done against the corporation, uh, such as property damage and different ways to damage property of the organization and, and personal property of people involved in the organization. These six people were accused of maintaining a website that allowed people to communicate that way about illegal acts. It would seem to me to be violating the First Amendment as uh, there are cases such as Texas versus Johnson, 1989, that said, well, let's start off. First Amendment in a, in a 101 nutshell says you can say whatever you want with certain exceptions. One of them is you're not allowed to incite lawless activity in a way using speech that will is likely to cause such lawless activity. And in fact, when it does incite lawless activity, that of course is going to be used as evidence against the speaker. In this case that I'm talking about, it's called the Shack 7, S-H-A-C 7. You can look it up on the internet and start getting information about it. I, I know a lot of you already have by recognizing some faces. Um, but these people were basically accused of just making information available. And the defense in their case, which went on for uh, many months, it was uh, tried and then retried, uh, each trial taking a few weeks. What happened was uh, the defense basically uh, conceded a lot of what happened but said we have free speech rights. 
Because then the second thing is the government could not accuse any of the people involved for doing anything other than maintaining a website. They could not identify who posted what message at any time. Another thing the government did was had a mob jury in this case. It convinced the judge that these people were terrorists and therefore the jurors could not be identified to the court. They were, their identities were kept secret, which created a pall in the courtroom to convince the jury that these people are so dangerous, these terrorists are so dangerous that we can't even tell them what your names are for fear that they're going to attack you. And this is before the jury even started. The reason why I call them mob juries, this is in New Jersey, where, yes, that family on uh, HBO, um, when mobsters were uh, first brought to court, they were worried about jurors' safety and for good reason. So they would uh, develop a procedure where they protect people's names. They actually use this procedure against people maintaining a website. And that just started the trial on the wrong foot. There are many other problems with the trial. But the government's persistence in using this word terrorism, in using any procedure it can to increase its power and control, must be fought, one, by using language against them, by pointing out to people who don't see what's happening, try to point it out to them, try to be careful about not using their words. When are you using their words in your speech? Listen to what you say. Use the word, say, protection or sabotage rather than terrorism. Educate other people about it. Try to agitate, try to organize. When we get enough backing, try to get legislative measures passed try to vote for legislative measures that would support this idea, and just be cognizant of all the s subtle ways that they are trying to get control over us. The struggle will go back in our direction, and it already is starting to go back in our direction. And we just need to be as persistent and organized as they are. Um. Could the panelists, uh, if you take, take a, or any of you can take a stab at this, uh, can you just describe for the audience the, the, the difference between a terrorist and an arsonist? What, what would the government's definition be? Uh, what, what would be the difference in being convicted of being a terrorist versus an arsonist? Well, um, I'm going to summarize. So there's a, a statute that came out of the USA Patriot Act called Domestic Terrorism. It's, it's just before the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act in Code uh, Title 18. Basically, domestic terrorists, I'm oversimplifying the act, it gets a little bit crazy, but basically somebody in the United States who endangers human life, that's the hard element, it's an element, part of the statute, to get over. Somebody who's, who endangers human life and in doing so is trying to coerce either the target, such as maybe we use a logging company as an example, or the government to change its policies and, and how it does business or how it, how it uh, governs. That is basically terrorism. The government is still persistent in the eco uh, green scare cases in calling these people terrorists, even though in open court it tells the judge, uh, Ann Aiken, that, that the government is not seeking terrorism enhancements against these people. So they have to show endangering human life. I think that is a big stumbling block for the government. They would love to be able to use terrorism enhancements, uh, increase the sentence for these people. But the cases, even if the government is able to prove its case, it will only prove that people were careful at not endangering uh, human life. So that's a big difference, I, I, as I see it. Steve may have, a, have an opinion about that as well. Do you have well, do you think of any other differences? I think that what Stu just said is a correct legal distinction. What I think is also important to keep in mind is that whether or not a person is charged with a particular crime, and as we've heard, the Congress has enacted laws that use the word terrorism in them. But people can be called and perceived to be terrorists, whether or not 
they're actually charged with a crime that includes that phrase. Well, I, I think it's important to understand a number of things when you talk about prevention and you know, preparation. You know, to be sure, some of the things that you're talking about in terms of preparation you know, are being discussed uh, in you know, a variety of media. How much truth there is to some of them, I think it's important to question. It is the reality that the government has been engaging in what I think most people would perceive to be legitimate efforts at preventing terrorist acts. Now, the problem that I think is on the minds of, of many people here tonight is, you know, where that line should be drawn. What is a legitimate uh, you know, effort to prevent an attack, and, and where does it uh, cross the line into intrusion into civil discourse? In 2001, two, um, my office saw a shift in our caseload, and the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, set up, as did all the U.S. Attorney's Offices across the country, terrorism units. Five or so assistant U.S. attorneys assigned here in Oregon. Very few prosecutions. And one can ask, you know, what were they doing? The response that you get from them is in assisting and advising the FBI and other law enforcement agencies to make sure that they complied with the law in their efforts to determine whether there were, uh, you know, bad guys around who were going to try to do things. And they would point to the fact that uh, in Oregon, uh, you know, there was the prosecution of the Portland Six, which became the Portland Seven. Uh, people who stood up in court and pled guilty to uh, efforts to commit crimes that happened to be crimes uh, that involved uh, going overseas to Afghanistan and, and you know, fighting against this country. Now, whether or not that is a good or bad law is also a different question. The Immigration and Naturalization Service had been arresting uh, Mexicans uh, primarily in this country illegally by the bucketful for many years. Those people were being prosecuted for you know, the crime of, of unlawfully coming back into the country. After 9-11, the INS shifted its priorities and the number of prosecutions of Mexicans for being here illegally uh, dropped. And those people were reassigned to do other things. And there has, as I have personally seen it, been shifts of that nature, and shifts of that nature that have involved, I think, what many people would uh, you know, agree are legitimate law enforcement activities. Then you get the, the problem of line drawing. Brandon Mayfield, Portland example, national example, of how action with perhaps you know, blinders on, perhaps uh, you know, what the FBI's report you know, called you know, confirmation bias, called uh, you know, big case bias. You have this horrible event that occurs and something you know, surfaces and the FBI itself in its publicly available discussion of what happened said, you know, this is a big case. And in big cases, people get carried away. And that's part of what happened there. Well, you have that kind of you know, crossing of the line. We all get blinders on. We all get you know, caught up in what it is that we're doing, whatever side of the political fence we're on. And there's no question that government agents uh, you know, do that today. They've done it historically. You know, whether it was Tommy the Traveler, who some people might remember from you know, some decades ago, or the infiltration of, of uh, you know, the Black Panthers, and, uh, or uh, you know, anti-Vietnam War groups, or Martin Luther King. You know, that's the history of this country. 
and it's happening again today. Now, before coming here tonight, my wife asks me the question, you know, why do you want to go there, Steve? You know, I'm a public official. And uh, she said, you know, the FBI is going to be there. Well, I understand that. And, you know, that is, uh, you know, a, a question that I think people should legitimately ask, you know, are there FBI agents here? If so, you know, why? Is that good? Is that bad? You know, where is the line between observing a legitimate dialogue under the First Amendment and crossing the line, becoming the agent provocateur, creating crime, which unfortunately is also part of the history of law enforcement in this country. So those are some thoughts that, that I would you know, feed back you know, in terms of very legitimate efforts to prevent the next terrorist act, and then the question of line drawing, you know, in the Patriot Act. And, you know, Bush says, uh, you know, I don't need to follow FISA. And is Congress going to stand up and say, wait a minute, we passed the law or not? The Bush administration had now Berkeley law professor John Wu, uh, you know, working in the Department of Justice. And he is one of the most outspoken people saying that presidential power in a time like this is essentially unlimited. And there are very conservative commentators who are frightened to death of that position. Now, I'm rambling on, Steve, so let me just go on one more thing. Last summer, the Judicial Conference of the Ninth Circuit, United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, well, if you're uh, you know, sitting out there you know, elsewhere, people perceive the Ninth Circuit as this liberal court. Well, practicing in front of it on a daily basis now for 23 years, I don't necessarily you know, subscribe to that. But they put on fascinating programs. Last summer, for all the judges of the Ninth Circuit, all the district court judges in the Ninth Circuit, bankruptcy judges, federal defenders, U.S. attorneys, and a variety of private practitioners, one of the panels was on the war on terror. First speaker was Anthony Lewis. Anthony Lewis, the champion of Clarence Earl Gideon, the champion of the First Amendment. Anthony Lewis, who bemoans the state of affairs in this country and the intrusion on all of our liberties. And Anthony gave a rousing talk about that. And I sat back and went, wow, isn't it cool that all these judges heard Anthony Lewis say that? The next two speakers were put on the program, I assume, for balance. One was a former Deputy Secretary of Defense, a fellow named John Hammer. The other, former counsel, I think it was the CIA, and if it wasn't the CIA, it was the NSA. And I was shocked to hear them say, Anthony Lewis is right. I was shocked to hear these people who had worked in Reagan and Bush administrations, Reagan, Bush I, and Bush II, say that they have not seen a grab of executive power such as we are currently experiencing with the Bush administration. Now, I share that uh, to, you know, just sort of put out there, there are thinking people on both sides of the political spectrum who look at what is going on and say, how do we draw the line? Where do we draw the line? And when, uh, I, I don't recall whether Stuart Ashley said, you know, in terms of, you know, we need to work together. There are allies with whom one, you know, could work who wouldn't come to a National Lawyers Guild meeting, but are probably as deeply concerned about some of the intrusion on liberty as are most of the people here tonight. I have an observation and a question, um, kind of an action item. My observation, based on what, Steve, what you just said and also what Ashley talked about, is what I kind of see as the, the perfect feedback loop for the executive. They have a war on terror, so they need terrorists. So now the executive has discretion to define what a terrorist is. So they can create terrorists and then indict them and arrest them, which you know really makes the public think, 
great, we have this strong father figure who can take, you know, can save us from terrorists, so we'll give them more power so they can define more terrorism, and it's this amazing feedback loop that's almost a closed cycle. And so my question is, how do we puncture that? How do we pop into that, stop the feedback loop? Because since it's really revolving in the executive branch, we've lost those checks and balances. Not that I trusted them particularly to begin with, but my, my question is for you and kind of a, a call to action for all of us, it seems like it's really in the public sphere now to do something to expose that. And how can we push back both inside the system and outside the system because the only thing that the administration is really going to listen to is that public backlash. If this becomes yet another thing that detracts, so rather than being seen as the father figure that's the protector, they're seen as the father figure that's the oppressor, which is the, what they don't want. So question to you and all of us to think about. Yeah. I think my kind of initial response to that is, I don't think the administration will respond to anything that the public does. So I think Congress is kind of where we have to focus our energies on that aspect. You know, and. Um, lobbying Congress, especially about these proposed bills to allow this surveillance program, I think is a major way to send a message that you, that we as a society won't vest all this power with the executive branch. Um, and I think with, uh, you know, the call for censure and people, I don't know how many people, I saw there was 200,000 signatures or something supporting it and that's a good start, but we kind of keep, keep, keep these issues in the forefront, keep writing letters to the editor, keep calling your you know, re representatives, keep talking to everybody you can talk to about it, that sort of thing, keep coming to forums, keep starting your own forums, that sort of thing. You know, my answer to that is continue to believe in democracy. You know, I am continually amazed when I listen to the people who talk about you know, the war on terror and particularly uh, you know, taking people out of our justice system and putting them into Navy brigs and uh, you know, what the government argued in the uh, you know, cases uh, that went to the Supreme Court a few years ago with uh, Padilla and Hamdi. You know, we can't do this. Well, I say we can't. Believe in this country. Our institutions are strong. We actually do have, on some level, a democracy. And when we lose it, it's because we don't believe in it and we don't act on it. And there's a, a judge in Seattle, uh, Jack Kunauer, who sentenced uh, uh, Mr. Rassam uh, a few months ago, a fellow who had crossed the border, uh, you know, who was going down to Los Angeles uh, to, to do a terrorist act. He ended up getting sentenced to 23 years in prison. And in imposing that lengthy sentence, he said afterwards, look world, we did this in the light of day. Look world, the American judicial system is strong. We indicted this guy, we prosecuted him, we took it through to a judgment, and he has now been sentenced and is going to spend 23 years in prison. Believe in America. When I talk about Brandon Mayfield's case, and go to criminal defense organizations, uh, I start by saying people can look at that case and can take any lesson from it that they want. How god-awful sick and perverse this country is. What a racist, you know, anti-religion, you know, group of people we are. You know, how on earth could anyone have put into an affidavit in support of an arrest warrant a guy was seen going into a mosque and say that gives you, you know, probable cause to arrest someone? What an outrage. On the other hand, one could say, what a triumph of our system that is. After 19 days, he was released from jail. And whether formal or not, there was an apology given to him. You look at it you know, through your political lens. And when you say, what can we do? Do this stuff. Speak out. And if we give up, then we're in trouble. I was just going to say, before Steve started talking, I swear, magnify the Brennan Mayfields. When they do this and they keep doing this feedback loop that Brennan so eloquently described, they will come across the Brennan Mayfields, and we need help 
magnifying that. That is the most powerful thing I think that people hear about is when they think about FBI overreaching, uh, it's Brandon Mayfield that keeps coming up. And you need to magnify that and keep that in the discourse that these things do happen. Um, you know, Craig has gotten eight grand jury subpoenas and one congressional subpoena for words. Um, so that helps too, to keep reminding people that the government is not what you think it is. Oh, yeah. uh, through that lens. <laughs> and I'm just not, not a, I'm not a public official, so I get to see what I want. <laughs> and I would add, keep up the support of people that are being scrutinized, people that are being subpoenaed, um, people that are being put on trial, people that are being accused. You have to keep up the support of them and keep the focus and keep the dialogue up regarding these people in their cases.